All right, let's uh, begin then looking at today's topic, which you can see they're heading up the top, by thinking about something you haven't looked at for a while and seems to have nothing to do with anything, really. What is this? What's this called? This is called auxiliary angle, right? Or subsidiary angle, um, or supplementary, supplementary, or all kinds of things. Um, what was this about? This is about looking at a sum or, or a difference of two trig functions, right? A sine and a cos. And then we rephrased it like this. What was different? There's three things I can see that are different on this side from that side. Shout out an obvious one. There's an R, okay. That wasn't the thing I was thinking of this but that's okay. Uh, I've got a recognition that the amplitude over here will not be the same as the individual amplitudes over on the left hand side. Okay, that's something different. What else? Okay, so there's the guy um, here after which this method is named. This is the auxiliary angle in auxiliary angle. Okay, uh, the most obvious thing about this hasn't been mentioned. There's no cause, it disappeared, what happened? You went from two functions to one, and the way that we went from two to one is by um, inserting these things, okay? Now what was the point of this? There were two, one of them was the, sort of the practical point, and then one of them, the other one was kind of a bit sort of big picture, right? The practical point was, when you rephrase something like this, in this way, you can solve a bunch of problems that you never could before. Right? Like if I asked you to solve sine x plus cos x equals 1, you'd, be, you'd sort of scratch your head a little bit and think, well, what do I do with that? Uh, it's not impossible to solve, it's just kind of don't know what to do. Hurry up. Out of interest, if you didn't know auxiliary angle, what would you do with this? Draw a graph, not a bad way to go. Uh, you would have to then, of course, have to work out what sine x plus cos x looks like. That would be okay. Um, not easy, but okay. Anything else you could do? Yeah. You could square everything. Now, that's a good way to go in terms of what we've been learning recently, because we've been thinking about quadratic functions a lot, right? Um, just out of interest, have a look. What would actually happen? What would you get on the right-hand side when you squared? That's, that's good. What would you get on the left hand side? You'd get sine squared plus cos squared plus 2, yeah, sine x cos x. Now very conveniently if you have a look at that, have a look at the left hand side, that sine squared plus cos squared I've separated out. Can you see why that might be a good idea? What is sine squared plus cos squared equal to? That's equal to 1, so very conveniently, those cancel out, which leaves you with this. Whoops. Equals 0, which means that this equals 0. And you can actually, you can solve that, can't you? Um, you have to be careful, you have to be careful, because from line 1 to line 2, when we square everything, you've got to be you know, cautious with what that does to your equation. When we've done that in the past, what has that done to the solutions when you squared everything? It's, um, it's often added more solutions. Do you, do you remember that? So if we get solutions out of this, not all of them may be solutions to the original question, but doable, right? Um, however, that is something of a coincidence. You can see I can muck with these numbers very simply, and you won't get this nice collapse happening on the left hand and the right hand side. So that was just luck, really. Now, I said that that was the practical reason. We do this so that now we can solve more questions, okay? But as a sort of broader mathematical thing, this is a perfect example. The reason why it's in the course is not so that you can solve these questions because when you get out in the real world, even if you're an engineer or, or um, an architect, someone who's actually gonna solve questions like this, you will get a computer to do this. You won't crunch through it. What we want you to get is, when you take a simple single object, uh, what's this gonna look like? I think it's gonna look something like this. ish, okay? When you take a single object and you look at it from two different angles, same object but you just kind of like pivot a little bit, a bit like looking at a diamond and if you've ever seen a gem before of any kind, when you move it a little bit, it looks like a whole different object, like it, the, the light refracts and it all looks crazy, but it's the same thing and you gain insights about how it works when you look at it from two different perspectives, right? And that is what today's topic within quadratics is about. 
Okay. So underneath this, I want you to consider this quadratic here, which is, of course could be any quadratic given different values of a, b, and c. Now, <coughs> excuse me. General form, as we've discussed before, is not particularly revealing. It doesn't show you very much about the structure or the shape of the parabola. You've got to muck with it in order to do that. For example, if you wanted to find out what the vertex was, what might be the simplest way to do it? There's lots of ways, but give me one. Say that again. Okay, you go straight to the axis of symmetry by using these two coefficients here, and then what would you do with that? You'd pop it back in. Okay. That's fine. I could also rephrase this equation. I could put it into a form that makes the vertex obvious, right? Well, what skill would I have to use? I'd have to complete a square. That would have rearranged this thing. I'd get something that looks a little more like, I mean, if this was a y, don't change that, it's fine. If this was a y, I would get something like this, like so, okay? And what would be the conclusion from this? Where would I say the vertex is? Have a look. It'd be, um, you get the x coordinate from here, so it'd be h, and then you get the y coordinate from here, so it'd be h comma k, right? So that's fine, that gets you the vertex. What if you wanted the roots? What if you wanted the roots? Where would you, um, how would you work with this thing? You could do the quadratic formula, because you don't know anything about a, b, and c, whether it's nice to factorize or not. But if you can factorize, that would be nice because just like this, from the factorized form, you can easily read off what the roots are. Okay? Now, the factorized form of this, I'm going to go back to the zero. <clears throat> the factorized form of this, I can predict what it will look like, assuming that there are roots. Let me, before I predict what it looks like, I want to ask about this number here. Why do I have to put a number there? Because a lot of the parabolas, quadratics you deal with don't have a number there. It's just x minus h all squared. What's that about? Think about it. Why does there have to be an A there if this is what I started with? Say it again, Celine. Nice and Yeah, over here, right? If there's an A here, for these two things to be equivalent, then there has to be an A over here as well. Okay? So now keep that knowledge in mind and think about what this would look like if it were factorized. Good morning. Hurry up. Be on time. Now remember, you don't know anything about what the roots are because you don't know what a, b, and c are. For all you know, there might not even be roots. We'll come back to that question in a second. But if you were to factorize, it would look something like this, would it not? What would you put in the brackets? If it were factorized, it would be x plus or take away something and x plus or take away something else, right? Okay, now remember, I don't know what any of these things are, so I'm going to give them some names. These two things here are going to be the roots. The customary name for the roots are alpha and beta, okay? So we use them not just for angles in deductive geometry, we also use them for the roots of a quadratic function, okay? Now this thing will have two roots, alpha and beta. But these two things aren't going to be equal unless a is going to be 1. Do you notice that? Because look, if I expand this out, how many x squareds will I get? Exactly 1. So just like over here, how am I going to fix that up? What will I do? I should make sure, just like all of these guys, I have a coefficient of a at the front. OK, so this is the diamond. And this, or these, uh, the two perspectives on the diamond, right? If these two things really are the same object, I should be able to gain some insights from them by looking at both and comparing them. In fact, that's what we did up with auxiliary angle. Do you remember that? See this guy over here on the right-hand side? You can expand this. This is one of the things we learn as extension 1 students. What is the expansion of sine x plus alpha? Sine x cos alpha plus? cos x sine alpha. You could put it in any order, of course, because they are just multi you know, products. We tend to try and keep the angles matched up. So I put my x's and then I've got my alphas. Okay. So when we did this, we noticed, oh, look, there's sine x's on the right-hand side, and there's sine x's on the left. And they must be equivalent. Yeah. 
In the same way, there are cos x's on the right and there are cos x's on the left, they must be equivalent as well. And we named this process comparing coefficients. Do you remember that? You're like, uh, coefficients over here, coefficients over here. It's the same object, remember? So these must match up. I'm going to play this same game with these two guys, right? If they really are the same object, then I should be able to say that ax squared plus bx plus c and I'm going to call your mind back to trig again, because when we say two things have to be exactly identical to each other, we don't just call that an equation, we call that an identity. So I'm going to put in three lines here. Okay? This indicates that this thing over the right hand side is not just equal sometimes, it's equal all the time irrespective of the values that I put in here. Okay? So, Remember, alpha and beta are the roots. I've introduced those in. We know what a, b, and c are. They're just the coefficients that can be any numbers. All right, let's see what happens here. Now, the first thing I want to do is try and get rid of these a's. Remember when we did completing the square? It's just finicky to deal with um, quadratics when they're non-monic, right? So I'm going to divide everything through by a. That looks on the left-hand side like it makes things worse, because I'm going to introduce fractions in a second. But go with me, because it's going to make the right-hand side much easier to deal with. OK, okay. 